Good morning. Hi, it's nice to see you all at home there too. I actually can't see you, but it sounded pretty good, right? Uh, my name is Doug Baker. I'm one of the pastors here at Community, and uh, this morning we continue on in a series we began last week. Pastor Trent introduced us to the first of our core values. We'll be exploring the six core values that uh, guide us as a church in the ministry that we do, how we conduct ourselves, values that uh, we want to infiltrate in every single thing that is Community Reformed Church. Last week, Pastor Trent began by talking about empowerment, the, the understanding, the belief that we are gifted by, poured into, and strengthened by God to so much more than we can imagine. And not only does God do that for us, but we also can do that for others. Uh, so that was number one. Number two, today we're going to be digging into authenticity. What is authenticity? If you go to our website and you read about authenticity on our website, you're going to see words like this. Uh, Even though it may cost us, it is better to be real and honest than to put on a front. So really powerful words, really good ones, ones that are tough to live into. Uh, I've struggled with myself as I was thinking about uh, getting into this message and, and unpacking authenticity. My default, like because of those words in our core value, the way that they're stated, I, I thought, all right, I, I really should talk about my early years in ministry. Started at my first church in 2002, and because I didn't know what I was doing, I had no clue what I was doing. Um, now, this is the point where some of you are like, well, he still doesn't really know what he's doing. I don't know. But no, it, it, I was making up as I went along, and the people had ideas about what it meant to be a pastor, so I just did what I thought they wanted me to do. I put on that pastor persona, you know, almost like putting on a suit for work. You know, you got the certain demeanor and a certain dignified presence. And, you know, you stand up there, and you start preaching, and you've got to have the preacher voice and, and read the scriptures with a certain authority. And, and after about nine years of that, it was exhausting. I thought, well, well we, let's talk about that. Let's unpack it. Let's zoom in on that. And as I was kind of putting that message together, it wasn't clicking. Like something wasn't right. Because here I was in Colossians 3, and Colossians 3 was like pulling me in a different direction, more uh, like a deeper uh, understanding of authenticity. I'm like, okay, so, so not that. And it's not that that conversation is a bad one to have. We do need to have those conversations. Because Our human relationships are important. The fact that we interact with each other as real people to real people is crucial. Authentically, we we need to bring ourselves because if we're going to truly follow that number one commandment, right? Love God and love our neighbors. I mean, to love someone, you got to know who they are. And if they're being fake with you, you don't actually know who they are. And if they're being fake, and if you're being... Like if everybody's being kind of fake, we've got kind of the personas on, no one knows who anybody is, you don't have any real relationships, and there's no actual love going on there. So there is a point to that that kind of understanding of authenticity. Um, To be really honest, I think think the piece about that that made me the most uncomfortable, kind of zooming in on that way of talking about it, was the fact that it was very like, Doug-centric, like it was very me-focused, and it was asking the question, it was asking the same questions that it seems like are being asked by the broader society, you know, how do I know who I am? Who's the real me? And it's my job to figure that out. So I've got to do a lot of looking in and, 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 and analysis of personal preferences and ideas and, and likes and dislikes, and then I can figure out who the real me is. And, uh, and I don't know, that that just, right now, that's just driving me crazy. I can't, I can't go there. Um, and mostly because I, I don't think we get a sense of who we are if we look inside first. Um, it's an incredibly subjective way to figure out authenticity. And if you know anything about being human, and I suspect you do, um, we as humans are notoriously untrustworthy about determining truth from subjective sources. Um, and what we feel and what we personally believe and think are, ex- are they're, object- they're, they're subjective. Uh, we make it up as we go along. Uh, that's the human condition. And when you're trying to figure out what's true, starting with opinion is not a good place to start. 
And we've got a culture out there telling us over and over, just pounding it into uh, us over and over again, no matter where you go, no matter who you talk to, if you go with what culture is saying, who you are comes intrinsically from within. What you personally prefer, choose, want, like, or desire, your distinct personality, culture says, is your authentic self. And that is so alluring. Because I don't know about you, but if I could just determine what's true by making it up as I go along, my world would be super happy all the time. <laughs> like it would just be molded in my image. And it doesn't matter. I mean, it's alluring to everyone. It doesn't, it's not just alluring to people who think differently than us and we disagree with them and they're just making it up. We all do it. We all try and fashion the world around us in, in the image of what we would love to see. But is that what's true? Is, it what, is, is that is what, re, uh, my words aren't working. Is that what is real? Like really real? There has to be a source of real. Because when it comes to understanding identity, when it comes to understanding authentically who we are, there is truth, objective truth. And if we get our origin story wrong, we will rip our world apart. So now enter in our God, the one who created, the one who made, the one who is, the one who started it all, the one who is the source of everything. He is the outside source of truth, objective truth which exists, and he is the one that determines it for his creation. He does this as a gift to us because he knows our foibles and proclivities, and he says, no, 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 I will be your source, source of all things. So when we come to the topic of authenticity, rather than look from the inside out for answers, we can look to what God says, and we, look to, we can look to where God looks, we can look to where God wants us to look for the answers we're seeking. In fact, in his word, in our passage today, the scripture we're going to be talking about is a passionate plea for the followers of Jesus Christ to seek what is real, what is authentic, from somewhere other than themselves. As Paul, so the guy who wrote our, our scripture for today, his name is Paul, and he wrote most of the books of the New Testament. Most of the books of the New Testament are these letters he wrote to other churches all around. And in, uh, in the bo book we're going to be in today is Colossians. Uh, he was writing to the church in Colossae, and he is uh, pleading. He's desperate for them to tear free from the shackles of their old identities and to marry themselves, to wed themselves, to inexorably and permanently, great word, right? Inexorable? Ooh, I like that. Permanently link themselves with Jesus, their Christ, their Savior, their life. That, uh, that we're not people of the world anymore. We're people of the word that, uh, that who we are, that our origin story as Christians is not of our making. We're made in the image of God. He's like creating uh, a shift. He's talking about one thing and he's saying, now, I, I know this is kind of what you're used to, but sh just a, a little shift. Sh just click it over a, a little bit and, and see it anew from a different angle. It's like going to the eye doctor. One, sh two. One, two which is clear, one, two. And one is fuzzy and our old selves, and two is crystal clear, seeing ourselves in light of the gospel. That's a, you, you, I, I love this, one of my favorite stories is of somebody who did that in real time, in real life, where they took something that was being said to them and they went, I'm gonna see this clearly. Uh, it goes all the way back to the um, Civil War and one of, the, one of the advisors of the president during the Civil War was 
talking to Abraham Lincoln, and he said, you know, Mr. President, I am so grateful that God is on the side of the union. To which President Lincoln responded, sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side. Because God is always right. You see that? One, two. That, I think, is what Paul is doing for the church in Colossae, for the whole church today. So listen to what he says about our identity. And I'm going to do something a little different than I normally do. Usually we like to kind of wander through and and talk about stories and let it kind of really hit us. I'm actually going to unpack each of these passages as we go along. So bear with me. It's a little outside of my comfort zone, but we're going to give it a shot. All right? Uh, You know what? Before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a chance to dig into your word and to know what it is you say. Help us to just catch this glimpse of truth and, and to, to, to like ingest it, to take it into ourselves and to make your truth our truth. Help us to shift our perception of reality from what was fuzzy to what is clear. For your glory and the glory of the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, Colossians chapter 3, we're going to start at verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Pause right away. He's talking to the church. He's not talking to the world. He's not laying out some truth that needs to be applied to all the people that don't know anything about Jesus and, oh, can you believe what's wrong with the world today? He's not talking about them. He's not pointed at them. All the things that he's about to say have nothing to do with the fallen, broken state of the world. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the people who follow Jesus, who say, yep, I follow Jesus Christ. I'm, a sa- uh, I'm saved by Jesus. I am a member of his body. I belong to him. That's who he's talking to. He's talking to us to you. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. You know where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. All right. You, he's he's, he's pointing to the church and he is telling us, folks, it matters. It matters what you worry about. It matters what you think about. It matters where your heart lies. It matters uh, what passions you pursue as a follower of Jesus in in the midst of a fallen world. There are a whole lot of things out there. They're going to want your attention. They're going to vie for your heart and your head, and they're going to want you to pay attention to them and to give yourself over to them and to pull you along. What do you give yourself to? What do you let into your home, into your ears, into your eyes? Because if you're alive with Christ, you have to ask, you must ask, are those things in alignment with what he says in his word? It matters. Verse 3. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You, you, that flesh identity piece, that that human brokenness piece, that part of you, that authentic you is now dead. Dead. You died. Like all the things that you would associate with death, the, 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 the break, the, the separation, the, the, it's never going to come back. It's never going to happen again. It is supposed to be dead. You don't have an identity apart from Christ anymore. That separate you is dead. Dead. And then we come to verse 4. And I got to tell you, when I came across verse 4, it blew my mind. Like, I got weird 
excited when I got to verse four, because I've read this, I don't know how many times I've read this passage, you know, you read through the Bible and you find things you like and you get to read them over and over again. And, and I've read this passage many times, but this past couple of weeks, I saw it in a way I've never seen it before. And it, I like, I, I, and it, so I have to tell you, get this, get this. This is so good. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Did you get it? So good. Like so many times you read that and you're like, oh, so we're going to be in heaven someday with Jesus. No, 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 no. The only time your new Jesus authentic self shows up is when Christ shows up first. The independent from you, Jesus, has died, is dead, no longer lives, because he is now your whole life. There is no life, there's no living, there's no authentic you without Jesus showing up first. When Christ, who is your life, when Christ appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You don't get to be in the room without Jesus. Not if you're going to be the true you that God made you to be. When you walk into the room, the first person that should be coming into that room is Jesus with you in tow, with you in tow. Like when people see you coming into a room, they'd be like, whoa, that person reminds me of Jesus. Like that's the whole, that's the thing. That's what this is saying. Jesus appears first and now you get to tag along. And when you get to tag along, you get to tag along in glory. Like that's really awesome. But you don't appear until Jesus appears first. Only when Christ appears, only when he is revealed, is the true me revealed with him. Does that just make you want to like freak out? I couldn't believe it. I'm like, whoa. Okay, so, but that means like this is serious stuff. Like that, that there's, there's no give or take in this. If, if people don't see Jesus when I'm interacting with them, then they don't see me because I live in Christ and he is all of my identity. There's no authenticity without him. He is our authentic self. And if that is, see now Paul goes on, like if that is true, let's get practical now. And he goes on to verse five here. So if that is true, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. It's because of these the wrath of God is coming. See, now, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all these things, you know, like uh, anger and rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other. You've taken off your old self with its practices. You've put on a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Why? Let's get practical now. Why? Why would you continue to wear the clothes of dead men? Spiritually speaking, why? You don't have to. It would, be, it would be exactly the same as if, for whatever reason, you had to go to prison, right? So just stop for a minute and think of a reason why you would have to go to prison. Okay. I'm not going to tell. And you spent your time in prison. You've done your time. You had to wear the orange jumpsuit the whole time. And now you get out of prison and you get home and you look at yourself and you go, you know what I miss? The orange jumpsuit. I should keep wearing that even though I'm free. It makes no sense. Why would you do that? I mean, some of you look really good in orange, but honestly. It's probably got like a DOC on the back and a number and all that kind of stuff. It would kind of mess with your life. You're going to get a job wearing the orange jumpsuit? Probably not. That doesn't, it's not real. It's not who you are anymore. So take it off. 
Now, now apply that to your whole identity. Apply that to your values. Apply that to your priorities. Apply that to the actions that you take every single day. That's what he is saying. That's what this passage is calling out. As much as it depends on you, bring your actual identity in Christ into alignment with how you live. If you belong to Christ, then belong to him and stop trying to live in two worlds. These things, these things he lists, they're, they're not a part of the living person we are in Jesus. They're dead to us. These things are dead to us unless we keep them alive, which we can do. We can choose to keep these things alive. If we feast at the trough of sinfulness, if we gorge ourselves on its fruit, those things will grow in us. If we are anemic in our pursuit of righteousness and holiness and sanctification, if we refuse to spend time investing into our relationship with Jesus, we will not have the strength to cast off the yoke of our oppressor. We will not be able to name out, call out when he lies to us. And Paul is saying to the church, don't forget who you are now in Christ. Keep that new identity at the forefront of your pursuits, of your expectations. Let Jesus always enter the room first. And then he wraps up with, with verse 11. Here, 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 there is no uh, Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So what, is, what does that mean? What are those things? I, I don't know. You can go and look at the history and you can see what those things mean and you can unpack them and, and what barbarians and Scythians were and all this good fun stuff. But really what this is, is a list of the common ways that people identified themselves back then. You'd be sitting in church in Colossae, and you would probably be able to look around and go, oh, that person's a Gentile, and that person's a Jew. That person, they're kind of from that uh, category of people called barbarians, and, and over there in that corner are the Scythians. And uh, worshiping up there in the balcony are the people who are still slaves to masters, and, and over there in that corner is the, you know, the free people, and you know, they've got freedom here in, in Rome. And, um, these were just words that people used to identify themselves and each other. And what Paul is saying when he lists them is stop thinking of yourselves in those terms. Why, why are you using those names for you? Those names don't matter anymore. What matters is disciple of Jesus and Christian and follower of Christ. Like that's, that's what matters. That's who you are now. Those other things, lay them down, set them, set them aside. It doesn't mean they stop being true of you, but you don't have to put them to the forefront of how you interact with the world. They're not what determines who you are anymore. And, and so he's got this list, right? And it made me wonder, like, how would I label myself? What, were, what would be the words that I would use? Like, to describe Doug Baker, right? Um, and... and it was, it was kind of fun, actually. I started kind of looking at it. Like, if, if Paul were writing this letter to me, write to me, what would, instead of these words, what would be the words that he would use? And so I'm going to go, I'm going to just go through them, and I'll tell you what's true for me. I want you, I encourage you, I challenge you as we're sitting here, and I'm unpacking this, try and think of the words that he might use for you. So, what, what would be some words Paul would use if he was writing this letter specifically to me? Um, well, uh, I, I always have grown up in a Reformed church, so theologically, denominationally, I would say I'm Reformed. Um, that means I'm not Methodist, I'm not Lutheran, I'm not Catholic, I'm not Baptist, I'm Reformed. I've always kind of liked it because when people will be like, reformed, what does that mean? Reformed from what? I'm like, ooh, history lesson. <laughs> um, and it would bore them to tears, but it was always fun for me. So if he was going to be writing this, he would be like, there is no longer reformed. 
Because is being reformed more important than being a follower of Jesus? I would say they're linked, and he would be like, yeah, yeah, it's just a way of keeping you separate from other people, isn't it? Well, okay. So what would, what would be another one? Well, um, like heritage-wise, I'm, I'm Dutch. Any other Dutch people here? <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> the whole room's like, <laughs> yeah, well. But you know what? We've lived in the United States, my family, for long enough. I guess I would actually just say American. Um, but is that more important than Jesus? Is that more important than the cross? Than my identity in Christ? What else would he say? Um, well, I mean, take one look at me. I'm Anglo, uh, which is a fancy way of saying I'm a white guy. Um, that's not going to change. But is that more important than Jesus? Ooh, here's a good one. Um, this is one that culture wants to talk about right now. Uh, Paul would probably say, hey, you're a straight guy. Okay? There's an identifier. Is that more important than Jesus? What about, um, what about uh, ooh, there's an election year coming. Um, there's probably some kind of political party which one is it? I'm not telling. Is that more important than Jesus? Is that an identifier that we use for ourselves? He would probably also say, um, yeah, I understand that you're theologically orthodox. Uh, I might also, ooh, let's talk to, for the sports people, um, he would probably go, and I understand, you know, there's no longer... I've got a soft place in my heart I have for 40 years now for the Dallas Cowboys. I, I apologize. I would say that I'm financially stable. He might use that to say that. I would say that I'm reasonably intelligent. I don't know if he would use that. But here are all these words, all these identity pieces that we put on ourselves, these things that we might say are very important, these things that set us apart in this world that make me unique. And God, through his word, is saying to me, relinquish every single one of these identifiers, their ownership over me, because I am supposed to belong only solely to Jesus Christ because Christ is all and he's the only one whose identity matters. That these things, these things are never supposed to come first. And this isn't a new thing that God is saying. This isn't the first time he said it. This has been something God has been saying through the Bible, through his word since the very beginning. He said this to Adam and Eve when he said to them, make me more important than what you want. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They had one job. And they didn't do it. Well, we want to be as smart as God. And so they did it. And they messed it up for everybody. And sin entered the world. Because God said, don't put anything in front of me. And then he did it again. He did it again. And he, actually, he did it. And somebody got it right. He said it to Abraham. He said, you know what? I know you have been dreaming and you've been wanting a kid for a hundred years. Well, now that you're a hundred years old, here you go. Here's that little boy you wanted. And he's got this beautiful little boy, Isaac, and he loves his boy. And he is like, this is a promise from God. He's been yearning for this, praying for this. And God finally answers his prayer. And then after a, a couple of years, God says to him, now take this answered prayer and sacrifice it. Will you? Will you put what I ask ahead of your dream? And Abraham says, okay. Now we love, thankfully, God stays his hand and there's a ram sacrificed instead. So we don't have that story to have to try and figure out. But then it happens again, and it happens again, and it happens again, over and over through the story of God's people. It even gets to Jesus. You remember the story of the rich young ruler? Comes up to Jesus, says, Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, well, just do all the things that God says you're supposed to do. And he goes, oh, I've done all those things. And Jesus says to him, well, sell everything you have and give all your money to the poor and then come and follow me. And the kid is like, I can't do that. I like being rich. So he turns and he walks away from Jesus. Over and over and over and over and over again, through the God's word, we're being challenged, asked, encouraged, 
if you are going to follow him, he needs to be first. He needs to be the first one in the room, always. In this passage, God urgently tries to help his people to tear free from their bondage and to let go of their flesh, that old identity, and to marry ourselves to Christ our Savior. And it is a marriage. And it's a mar- like actual, the way that it works in that relationship, it is meant to be like a marriage where we belong to him and he belongs to us. And we don't just belong to the idea of him. That's something that we need to keep separate. It is not the idea of Jesus that we join when we become Christians. It is Jesus himself who we join to. I was listening to a Christian historian recently, a guy by the name of uh, Dr. Gary Habermas, and he was giving this wonderful outline of the, of the, the case for the story of Jesus historically, authentically. Wonderful, uh, wonderful video that I was watching. And at the end, he said something that was a little bit different, and I loved it. It just hit me hard. He said this, when you get married, you don't say I do to good looks. You don't say I do to smart, and you don't say I do to fun to be with, or I love the jokes. You don't marry those things. You marry the person who is those things. So when you say yes to Jesus, You marry the person, Jesus. You are united with Jesus. You're not just saying yes to an idea of salvation. You're saying yes to the person of Christ. He belongs to you. You belong to him. So when we take on this Christian identity, when we say yes to Jesus, we don't just join ideas. We don't hitch our wagon to traditions or viewpoints or conservatism, or activism, or any kind of ideological stand on any social issue. When we say yes to Jesus, we are joining our identity to the one who is eternal, with Jesus who is Lord, who died on the cross because of our sin, because it needed to be addressed, who rose again to conquer death. We die with him in his death, and we rise with him in his resurrection. He is our one and only. He is our precious one. Everything about him is what everything about us is supposed to be. Everything else that we we might want to identify with or everything else we want to claim is important or get all riled up about, those things get set aside. They get crucified on the cross with our sins because Jesus alone is our soul heartbeat. He is the breath in our lungs. He is the rally cry in our minds. He is the gnawing passion in our guts. That's what it means to be Christian. And if he is not the central focus of every step, then we are not living an authentic life. Then we're not the real us that God intended as he fearfully and wonderfully knit us together in our mother's womb. It is this level of authenticity, this declaration that it is not me, I, this is, The real me is dependent on the real Jesus and revealing him. And high ideals, grand philosophies do not save people. Jesus saves people. It is the gospel alone that offers salvation and transforms lives. My authentic self has nothing to do with the things about me that make me unique from the rest of the world. My authentic self is the revelation of the light of God of his glory, of the presence of the body of Christ. I am nothing apart from him. We are nothing apart from him. As a follower of Christ, the only time we are being authentic is when people see Jesus in us. That's authenticity. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your for your faithfulness, for helping us to see things for the way they actually are, for being the one who determines what is real, for being the one who gives us truth. Help us to see ourselves in light of who Jesus is, to understand who we are through the cross, to be with 
him. Lord, show us. Show us how we identify in ways that are not healthy, that don't have anything to do with that, the things that we put first in front of Christ. And help us to sacrifice them, to lay them down, so that Christ can be the first one in the room. We ask this, we pray this in Jesus' name.